Well, this is it. Flash player support has officially ended, and it's gonna stop working in browsers... tomorrow. It's... over. This ticking clock has been looming over my head since I started, and what do I have to show for it? In these two years, I've only covered... 13 out of the hundreds of games that I have memories with or that I think are notable enough. <sighs> I'd say we have to speed it up. And after all, many Flash games are just too simple to necessitate their own videos. I mean, did you really expect me to be able to talk about marble lines for 12 minutes? But these games are still an important part of Flash game history. They hold a special place in a lot of our hearts, so I still want to give them a spotlight. One of the best things about Flash was being able to play thousands of simple, fun games for free just by opening your web browser. And while many Flash games aren't going anywhere, and that void has somewhat been filled in by other formats, the way we experience Flash content going forward will be very different, so I figured we should play some games in the way they were originally intended for possibly the last time while we have the chance. And by that I mean just hopping around to different sites and playing a whole bunch of games. So, introducing Flash Game Reviews Rapid Fire, the possible subseries in which I'll review several smaller Flash games in one video. The format should be pretty self-explanatory, I'll review each game mostly like I would normally and then immediately move on to the next one. I'll try to give as much background info for these games as I usually do, but keep in mind that there's not much to go off for some of these. Make sure to stick around to the end where I'll talk more about the Flash shutdown as well as a few preservation projects you should check out. Alright, we've got nine games to cover, so let's hop right into it. Starting with one that everyone's played on Cool Math in School at one point or another, Bloxors. This game was created by Damien Clark and originally released on June 21st, 2007. There's a more recent HTML5 version on Miniclip with several new features, but I'll be sticking with the classic Flash version due to reasonably reasonable reasons. Bloxors is a block rolling puzzle game where you have to maneuver this rectangular box through each level and have it fall through the square hole to win. The controls are super simple, all you do is use the arrow keys to move around. There are 33 levels, each of which of course progressing in difficulty. There isn't a save feature, but there is a password for each level if you want to pick up where you left off. Many levels contain switches, which activate bridges required to progress. The circular ones can be activated in any way, but the X-shaped ones require more pressure and can only be triggered if your block is standing upright. There's also these orange tiles, which are fragile and will fall if you stand your box up vertically on them. The most interesting element are these teleporters that split your block into two cubes. These can be controlled individually by switching between them with the space bar, and can be joined back together by placing them next to each other. With all these elements mixed together, this game really requires you to use your brain, which of course means that I am completely terrible at it. Even just moving around requires a lot of thought due to the shape of your block, but it's pretty satisfying once you figure out how to solve each level. As for the presentation, the 3D visuals look pretty alright for a Flash game. The ambient music gives the game a strangely eerie atmosphere, which was an interesting choice, but... It works. Oh, and I really like the sound effects when your block moves for some reason. It gives off a very realistic and satisfying sounding feedback. Overall, if you want a simple to learn but hard to master puzzle game that really makes you think, Bloxors is a pretty good one. Moving on to another block game, B-Cubed. This one was actually created by Cool Math Games, which kind of surprised me since I always thought Cool Math just took games from other sites and Trojan Horse them past school blocking programs by calling their site Math Games, but I guess not. The game's fairly similar to Bloxors, but I actually like this one a bit more. You control a yellow cube and simply have to slide yourself to the red tile in each level to win. The twist is, after you move off a tile, it'll fall, so you have to take the right path through each stage and drop all the tiles before getting to the goal. The gameplay is simple, easily understandable, but fun. There are a bunch of differently colored tiles that serve different functions, like creating bridges, bringing in new land, or teleporting you around. There are also a few levels where you have to control two blocks at once. Huh, seems familiar. Again, the game doesn't save, but there are passwords or access codes for each of the 30 stages. The atmosphere and music is just standard outer spacey stuff, and the graphics, well, uh, they do the job for the type of game this is, I guess. So yeah, there's really not much to say about B-Cubed, it's just a pretty fun little game. Next up, the world's hardest game? Pfft, really? <laughs> I'm sure I can handle this. <laughs> Oh, okay. 
Okay, so this may come as a bit of a shocker, but the world's hardest game is pretty hard. If there's one thing you should know about me, it's that I am absolutely terrible at video games. Like, really bad. So it should come as no surprise that back when everyone was playing this game, I could never get far in it. This game was quite infamous back in the day, and even today I still see people talking about it occasionally, and it has an active speedrunning community too. It was created by the From What I Can Tell Now Defunct website Snubbyland and unleashed onto the world on December 15th, 2000. The rules are super simple. You control the red square, avoid the blue circles, and must get to the green area to finish each level. Many levels also require you to collect all the yellow circles to pass. If there are multiple green areas, everyone except the last act as checkpoints. That's it. Similarly simplistic are the graphics, which are practically non-existent. Yeah, they're iconic and fit the game well, but like, that doesn't make them any less boring. <laughs> Music is fine, it's just a slightly repetitive techno loop. And I really like how the death sound is just that stock cartoon punch sound effect you hear everywhere. <laughs> so about the difficulty. Yeah, it's tough. It starts out fine, but then the enemies, I guess, start moving faster and in more unpredictable patterns, the coins are in harder to reach areas, and the whole time the game keeps taunting you with these messages that show up before each level. The thing is, I wouldn't exactly describe the challenge as unfair, it's just really, really hard. So I'll at least commend them for not relying on completely garbage design. And in case this wasn't obvious enough, no, I didn't beat it. If I couldn't beat Super Mario Flash, what makes you think I could beat the world's hardest game? With enough practice, you definitely could do it, but I just don't have the time or patience for that. As is standard for these sorts of purposefully hard games, it keeps track of your deaths, with this number acting as your score. If you somehow do make it through all 30 levels, you can submit your score, but don't do that on the original Flash version because the website is dead and will redirect to some sketchy sites. One year after the original, in 2008, we got the world's hardest game 2. Wait, doesn't the existence of a sequel imply that the original wasn't actually the world's hardest game? Eh, whatever, it exists. In fact, four of them do. This is basically the same thing again, but with more levels and a few minor changes. The coins are animated now, whoop de doo This time around, many levels task you with collecting keys to open doors. World's Hardest Game 3 makes you go through a maze just to navigate the menu, and honestly, that's pretty funny, I'll give them credit for that one. Here they tried to give the player character personality by adding speech bubble dialogue, but this is literally just a red square, it, it doesn't work. The fourth game took this even further by adding voice acting. You just made the biggest mistake of your life. Yeah, I'd say that's my cue to move on. I really don't like games that are difficult just for the sake of being difficult. And the world's hardest game is the very definition of that. It has absolutely nothing interesting going on besides it being hard. I get that that's the point, but it's just not really my thing. I know these games are seen by many as classic Flash games, but personally, I'm not a fan. And I already know someone's gonna comment, Well, Sean, you just don't like these games because you're bad at them. And you know what? You're probably right. So let's say you just finished playing World's Hardest Game, and now you're filled with primal gamer rage and really need something to take your anger out on. Well, luckily for you, I've got just the thing. Interactive Buddy. I heard this one was really popular, but I personally have actually never played it until now. This was created by Shock Value and originated on his DeviantArt page under the title DeviantArt Buddy in 2004, and was received positively. Then, on February 8, 2005, it was released on Newgrounds under its current title, where it gained much of its popularity. As the title suggests, Interactive Buddy isn't really a game, it's a sandbox where you're given this little guy who you can abuse in practically any way you see fit. I mean, theoretically, you could take good care of your buddy, but there are much more tools for violence than anything else. There isn't any actual goal in mind, you can just screw around and do whatever you want, and I really like that. The main way to interact with your buddy is using items, each of which fall under different categories. You can select these from the drop-down menu, and they can be used simply by moving the mouse and clicking. Fists, bowling balls, guns, explosives, gravity vortexes, babies, no matter what you throw at him, this guy can endure anything. The sheer chaos you can create by mixing different items is just really fun. There are also skins which change your buddy's appearance. These are very much products of the time this was released in. I mean, if you ever wanted to tickle Bill Gates, this is the game for you. Some of them have dialogue, some of them have voice clips, but all of them were before my time. Except the Teletubby, that one, that one makes sense. 
There are also these modes that adjust certain game elements, like low gravity, earthquake, dynamic camera, and of course blood. By interacting with your buddy, you'll earn money, which can be used to buy more items, skins, and modes. There's also this mood display that shows your buddy's current mood, but from what I can tell, it doesn't really have an effect on anything. It doesn't matter if the interaction is positive or negative, you'll gain money no matter what. The physics engine and Buddy's AI are honestly pretty impressive for a Flash thing from its time. Due to this, the graphics were kept very simple to reduce lag, but you can still adjust the quality in the settings. There's also Interactive Buddy 2, which has a much more in-depth physics engine, but this game seems to be more aimed at people who want to make complex creations with all the tools available, which is perfectly fine, but personally I prefer the simple slapstick fun of the first game. And that pretty much sums it up. It's simple, addictive, violent, and fun! Yeah, honestly, I got a lot more enjoyment out of Interactive Buddy than I expected to, especially as someone who didn't grow up with it. It's a really entertaining little distraction for a while. Next in line is 60 Seconds Burger Run. Created by GameShot, this is a platformer where you control this quite rotund individual and have to run and jump through dangerous obstacles to get to your favorite burger restaurant before it closes in 60 seconds. It's a pretty standard platformer, but you can break through brick blocks by jumping on them because fat. You have to reach the bus stop at the end of each area to be transported to the next. If you fall off or touch spikes, you'll restart at the area you were on, but at that point you probably won't have enough time to make it. Yep, as the title blatantly implies, there is a 60 second time limit, so you only have a minute to win it. Yeah, this is kinda one of those games that's hard for the sake of being hard, but honestly, I think this game is an example of that genre done right. Instead of being about unfair design, Burger Run is all about memorization and finding the fastest route to take within the time limit. It's actually really satisfying to learn the layout and get better at the game, and once you do, you'll be able to beat it pretty consistently. The time limit is quite daunting at first, but once you get better, it's almost a non-issue. The problem is, once you do beat the game, there isn't really a reason to play it ever again, unless you want to speedrun it or something. Technically, the game is extremely short, I've literally been talking about it for longer than it lasts, but you're not going to be able to beat it on your first try. It takes practice, which is where most of your playtime will come from. The graphics have a retro pixel art style, which is something that not many Flash games go for, and it looks nice. The sprites and animations are all really high quality, so yeah, this is a pretty good game here. It manages to be quite challenging, but not completely completely unfair in a really interesting way. Oh, and also there's this thing. I remember a ton of games, especially on Cool Math, had these Christmas variations that were basically the same game but with different levels and a Christmas theme, and 60 Second Santa Run is a prime example. Instead of trying to get to your favorite burgeria, this time you're Santa Claus and have to get to your workshop before it closes in, once again, 60 seconds. But unlike most other Christmas versions of games, this one's actually harder. Or maybe I just don't have it memorized as well as the original. There are some new obstacles here and there, like falling platforms and lasers that make it a bit trickier. If you like Burger Run, this is just more of it but with a Christmassy theme, and that's fine by me. From the makers of Cool Cool Mountain, Dry Dry Desert, and Ice Ice Outpost comes Wild Wild Taxi. Yes, this taxi is just so wild that they had to name it twice. This is one that I remember playing on primary games a lot in elementary school. You play as an extremely irresponsible taxi driver and basically just try to drive for as long as possible while avoiding crashing into other cars. You speed up and slow down with the up and down arrows, switch lanes with left and right, and press space to jump. The gameplay is kind of like one of those mobile endless runner games, what with the three lane structure and jumping over up obstacles, the main difference is that you're able to control your speed. You have a time limit to get to the next level, which is signified by a flag, with later levels having more cars to dodge and stricter time limits. If you can't make it to the flag in time, you lose. There isn't an ending, you just keep going until you run out of time. The controls can be kind of finicky sometimes. You can't switch lanes in mid-air, and if you get stuck behind a car, it can take a while to build up enough speed to jump over it. The 3D effect is decent for what I assume is a pretty old Flash game, but all the sprites just look like stock image clip art. In fact, they probably are. I at least wish the background changed as you got to new levels or something, because you spend the entire game staring at the same dull landscape and never-ending road. What else is there to even say about this game? I could barely even find any information about who made it or when it came out. There's a mobile version apparently created by Fupa Games Incorporated, but that's all I could find. There are no credits or any other names attached to the game. Oddly enough though, I found another game that's completely identical to Wild Wild Taxi besides having different graphics called Taxi Gone Wild. At first I thought maybe Wild Wild Taxi was a sequel to this, but from what I can tell there are literally no gameplay differences, the only things that are different are the visuals and sounds. Yeah, it turns out there's not that much to talk about with Wild Wild Taxi. It's a decent time waster, but not really much to write home about. 
Here's another member of the elusive Primary Games Top 10 list squad, Monkey Go Happy. In fact, when I'm writing this, it's at number one, with Dune Buggy right behind it in second, which is the highest I've seen it in a while. Come on, man, it's so close! Oh, by the way, Primary Games was able to make Dune Buggy work without Flash, so it'll always still be playable in browsers, which is great. What was I talking about again? Oh yeah, some monkey game or something. Released in 2008 by Pencil Kids, Monkey Go Happy is a puzzle game in which you have to figure out how to make this monkey go happy by doing something different in each level. You'll have to win a claw machine, go bowling, decorate a Christmas tree, light a firework, murder some ducks, you know, normal monkey business. I'll say one thing this game definitely excels at is variety. None of its puzzles really feel the same. In each one, you're given a screen with a monkey who is certainly not going happy, and you need to fix that by clicking on a bunch of stuff until you figure it out. All of them are pretty easy. Honestly, the only level that was actually hard is this maze you have to navigate with your mouse pointer where you can't touch the walls, but you can literally just right click to cheat it. I'm not the biggest fan of the game's art style. It's got that sort of generic, cheap, kids game style, you, you know what I'm talking about. The game also challenges you to try to clear it in the minimum number of clicks, which is a nice optional challenge for a game like this. At the end, the game gives you a rank based on how few times you clicked, as well as your time, ranging from sad ape to crazy cool cool chimp. The game is really short, there are only 15 levels, you could beat it in like 5 minutes if you know what you're doing, but you're in luck if you want more Monkey Go Happy because there are a TON of sequels, which are basically just the same idea again but with new puzzles. It's actually bizarrely hard to tell how many games there even are in this series. There is literally no concrete answer to the question, how many Monkey Go Happy games are there? But I counted all the ones I could find, and there are at least 60. No, I am not exaggerating whatsoever. I am dead serious. Over 60 games. May I ask why? Where are these coming from? Who wanted this many? Who knows, maybe I'll return to the series if people really want me to, but to me all these games just kind of feel the same. They're not bad, they're just kind of there. Although, there is actually a compilation of the first five games on Steam that is completely free and has no ads and no microtransactions, which is just like... What? That's completely unheard of. Although you can kind of see why. This is literally just running on an offline Flash player. Being able to open the Steam overlay while in a Flash player is so bizarre and I love it. The games have a wider aspect ratio. You can choose from different monkeys and different hats. It's honestly an alright package. So I guess I'd recommend playing this one. Any more Monkey Go Happy than this is just a bit excessive. Next on the list, released in February of 2011, is Sugar Sugar. Let's start off with possibly the most striking aspect of the game, the visuals. Every level is composed of only different shades of the same color, and this streamlined style works perfectly for this type of game. Likewise, the music is amazing and perfectly complements the chill, relaxed vibe of the gameplay. But what exactly is that gameplay? Sugar Sugar is a physics-based puzzle game where you have to draw lines with the mouse to guide a certain amount of sugar into each of the cups to win. And yes, the sugar is coming out of the comma in the game's logo, I love that. It starts off simple, but the levels get increasingly complex as it goes on. First, it introduces these filters that change the color of the sugar when it passes through them. You have to get the right colored sugar into the corresponding colored cup. Then there's the gravity switch button, which does exactly what it says. There's also these striped mugs where you have to put in half of one color and half of another color. And in some levels, if sugar falls through the bottom of the screen, it will wrap back around to the top. So yeah, it gets complicated, but never too hard as long as you're patient enough. The difficulty is just right. I really like how there's not just one solution to each puzzle. You're encouraged to think outside the box and discover your own way. There are 30 levels. Wow, if I had a nickel for every time today I played a game with 30 levels, I'd have three nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened thrice, right? You can even unlock a free play mode where you can draw whatever you want by beating all the levels. So that's nice that they give you an incentive. The gameplay can definitely be slow at times, but honestly I feel like that's kind of the point? It helps contribute to the relaxing vibe, and just watching the sugar fall is honestly kind of fascinating. The physics engine is really good. One kind of silly problem though is that there's no pause button. You can reset the level or quit, but not pause. And just like the other line drawing game I've covered, there's no eraser tool, but in this case I feel like having it would probably make the game way too easy. And the main reason the lack of an eraser sucked in Snowline was because of the undo button, which Sugar Sugar doesn't have. 
Also, the lack of an eraser here is very obviously intentional since there actually is one in free play mode. Sugar Sugar 2 and Sugar Sugar the Christmas Special continue the same formula, although 2 does have a new feature, these portals that let you teleport sugar. The levels in these are built around more defined objects and silhouettes, which makes them stand out more while still retaining the art style of the original game. Sugar Sugar 3 has more detailed graphics, and honestly I'm not really a fan of them. I think the streamlined, clean aesthetic was part of the appeal of the first two games. Not sure how to feel about Mr. Photorealistic Spoons over here, but at the end of the day, it's still Sugar Sugar, so it's still fun. This series was created by Bart Bont, an indie developer who's made a ton of puzzle games similar to this on both web and mobile platforms. And they're all just as creative and unique. This guy really deserves more respect. And just recently, he released a collection of a bunch of his Flash games on Steam as the Bart Bont Collection. This features a total of 28 games, including the Sugar Sugar series as well as the Factory Ball series, which you may also remember. This is honestly a really solid collection. I'd highly recommend it if you're looking for some simple, fun, and chill puzzle games, especially at only $10. For 28 games, that's 35 cents per game. This is a great way to preserve these games officially, and I'm hoping even more developers do stuff like this in the future. But anyway, that's Sugar Sugar. And as long as you have the patience for it, it's a thoroughly enjoyable and relaxing experience, and just a great game in general. Well, we made it, the last game for today, and it's definitely one of my favorites. Created by Silent Games and originally released on May 28th, 2011, it's Ninja Painter. Your objective is to paint all the walls in each level the right color, then get to the door to finish. You have to pick up the right color paint, then pass the walls with an X marked in that color to paint them. By using either the arrow keys or just clicking in the direction you want to go, you'll jump and keep going until you hit a wall. If you hit a slope, you'll bounce in the direction it's pointing. There are also ladders, which you can use to stop and climb where there are no walls. Also, there are three optional stars to collect in each level if you want to get 100%. That's kinda it. The game is really simple, but it creates a very fun and satisfying gameplay loop. There are 30 levels, hey we're up to 4 nickels now, split between 3 different areas, village, town, and megapolis. The first two worlds are pretty easy, but the last one can get kinda puzzling. You really have to think before you leave so you don't end up flying out of a window. The presentation is really nice. The combination of the 3D looking ninja with the nicely drawn tiles and backgrounds is just really appealing to me for whatever reason. And the music is surprisingly pretty great. I mean, some of the instruments you use kind of sound like Sonic 4, but like, for a Flash game like this, it's really good. There are even achievements. I mean, they're all really easy to get. You get all of them just by playing through the game normally and collecting all the stars, but hey, they're cool to have, I guess. And that's about it for the original Ninja Painter. I definitely recommend it. It's a lot of fun as a thing you can just blaze through in under an hour. It's short, but manages to be enjoyable the whole way through. There's also the exclusive Ninja Painter Cool Math Edition, which is the exact same game but with different levels. Levels. Not much to say here. Ninja Painter 2, on the other hand, is actually a pretty great sequel. It introduces some neat new mechanics like doors you need to pick up keys to open and switches that make blocks appear and disappear. You also have the choice of two playable characters now, with a new female ninja. They also made this sort of spin-off thing called Ninja Miner, where instead of painting, you're mining. The main difference is that the levels are larger than one screen now. It's okay. There's also an official reskin of Ninja Miner that makes it look like Minecraft, which is... uh... what? This has got to be infringing on some sort of copyright, right? And again, this is official. It's on Silent Games' website. Alrighty then. And that's all the games for today. Before moving on, just for the heck of it, let's briefly rank them all from my least favorite to my favorite. Keep in mind that I don't actually think any of these games are exactly bad, I just like some more than others. At number 9, we have Wild Wild Taxi, then World's Hardest Game, Monkey Go Happy, Block Soars, B Cubed, Interactive Buddy, 60 Seconds Burger Run, then Ninja Painter, and finally Sugar Sugar. Yeah, I know I went on about how I don't really like World's Hardest Game, but honestly, it's just more interesting than Wild Wild Taxi. This list is bound to change since I'm the most indecisive person on the planet, but for now, I'm going with this. I gotta say, it was really fun revisiting all these games that I have fond memories of playing as a kid and Interactive Buddy. Hopefully you remembered some of these games too and felt just a little nostalgic. And hopefully the pain of trying to come up with interesting things to say about nine different games in one video was worth it. <sighs> Welp, here we are. Flash is dead. 
Well, not exactly dead, but you can't run Flash in most browsers anymore. I know it had a ton of issues and was largely replaced by more modern formats, but it's still sad to see it go. Flash games have created so many great memories for us over the years. We all played these games during school when we were supposed to be doing work, or just at home because they were so fun. But for a while, nobody talked about them. You know, when I first started this series two years ago, I felt alone. It felt like no one else cared about Flash games or their legacy and importance. But now that's completely changed. Or, much more likely, I just didn't know where to look. Because a year before I began Flash game reviews, a certain project was started that you may or may not have heard about. And this thing is, simply put, a miracle. Ever hear of Flashpoint? Back in 2018, a guy by the name of Blue Maxima realized the importance of the preservation of Flash content with its upcoming demise, and started to put together an archive known as Flashpoint. Since then, it's become a massive project with tons of contributors working to save not only Flash content, but tons of other platforms as well from becoming lost to time. There are two main builds, Flashpoint Infinity, which downloads the games as you play them, and Ultimate, which has all the games pre-downloaded so you can play offline. I'd definitely go with Infinity, unless you just have over 500GB of free hard drive space you don't know what to do with. Once you have it installed, you can search for what you want, or just browse, then click on a game, click play, and BAM, there it is! It's so seamless! Pretty much any Flash game I could think of, when I searched for it, it was there! It's insane, it's almost like there's over 70,000 of them! And it's not just Flash games, there's also games from other platforms, like HTML5 and Unity Player, as well as tons of Flash animations. You can even make your own playlists or browse through the pre-included ones. Flashpoint is just by far the quickest and most convenient way to play Flash games post-shutdown. It's just so nice to see a game you remember, then just click and instantly be playing it and reliving those memories. Flashpoint also let me discover some of the popular Flash games that I actually missed out on and never played before, some of which will be getting their own videos soon. In summary, Flashpoint is just incredible, and I highly recommend checking it out if you haven't already. It's just such an amazing way to preserve these games, while also creating a genuinely great platform where you have all these different games in one convenient place. As always, the link is in the description. All the games I've talked about today are on Flashpoint, so if you want to play them, just search for them there. Another preservation project I'd like to bring up is Ruffle, a Flash player emulator which aims to allow you to continue playing Flash content in browsers. I haven't had much luck getting the browser extension to work myself, but plenty of websites have it built in as a way to continue to support Flash games, which is great! Even if it's still early in development and definitely not perfect, it's another project I have a lot of respect for. Back when the Flash shutdown was just a distant threat, I remember being worried that it would mean I would have to stop making Flash game videos, or it would profoundly change how I make them. But thankfully, that's just not the case at all. And that's largely thanks to the incredible efforts of the people behind preservation projects such as Flashpoint and Ruffle. So to end off, I just want to give a huge, sincere thank Thank you to every single person involved with these projects. You're doing incredible work to preserve internet and gaming history. Without your efforts, many of these games would probably be lost media. It's ironic that even though Flash is technically dead, it feels like Flash content is more popular and appreciated than ever. It really goes to show the strength of the communities it helped inspire and build, and of course of nostalgia. It's honestly beautiful to see everyone coming together through their shared memories. Flash may be gone, but the communities it formed and memories it created aren't going anywhere anytime soon.